Was Bruno Richard Hauptmann deliberately sent to his death? The old Lindbergh house in Hopewell, New Jersey is today a state home for juvenile delinquents. The corner of the second floor was once the Lindbergh's nursery. The kidnapper entered through this window to reach the sleeping baby. The baby was then carried down this shaky wooden ladder. But did Bruno Hauptmann build it and then steal the Lindbergh child? You never took your children into that bedroom, did you? I never was. You never took that ladder up there either, did you? You didn't build it. You didn't take that ladder out of your attic either, did you? No, sir. One of the major pieces of physical evidence against Hauptmann was the ladder. The police and prosecution claimed that Hauptmann climbed into his attic cut a piece of floorboard out of the attic, went back down to his apartment, two floors down, back to his garage, in which there was a great deal of lumber, uh, to use this piece of wood to construct the ladder. And a expert witness testified that the grains of wood from the remaining piece in the attic floor matched precisely the rail of the ladder that they claimed Hauptmann took out of the attic. The fact is, you could see very clearly when you put the two pieces together, then in order to make the grains match, one has to shove one of the pieces up higher in a very unnatural, distorted position. Based on this and other evidence, Scaduto believes that the wood in the ladder may have been tampered with while in the possession of the police. The ladder, however, is only a part of the evidence that Scaduto uncovered. The woods about a mile from the Lindbergh house is the site where the baby's body was found. It was quickly buried in a shallow grave. Scaduto discovered evidence that the body was not the missing child. The body that was found was in such a severe state of decomposition that the family doctor on looking at the corpse said, if you gave me a million dollars, I could not identify this thing. Lindbergh made the identification solely on the basis of counting the number of teeth. Uh, any child of the same age, generally, millions of children of the same age, would have the same number of teeth. The chances are that that body was not the body of the Lindbergh baby, which means that no murder has been proved, which means that Hauptmann was absolutely wrongly convicted, forgetting all the other evidence. He was wrongly convicted because they could not prove a murder. When police discovered ransom money hidden in Hauptmann's garage, Hauptmann claimed that the cash belonged to a man named Isidore Fish. Fish, he said, was a business partner who had gone to Europe and then died. Hauptmann insisted he discovered the cash in a box Fish had left for safekeeping. The explanation seemed far-fetched and was dubbed the Fishy Story. I found in the files of the district attorney's office and the New York City Police Department that evidence to show that Hauptmann and Fish indeed were business partners, evidence that was suppressed to destroy Hauptmann's alibi, uh, to create this fishy story that Hauptmann was telling. Uh, also, uh, evidence that Hauptmann and Fish did not meet until four or five, three, four months after the kidnapping so that there was no possibility that they had been partners even in the kidnapping and seizing of the ransom. All of this was suppressed in order to destroy Hauptmann's alibis. Handwriting played an important role in the conviction of Bruno Hauptmann. The prosecution's chief handwriting expert was Albert Osborne. The physical evidence connecting the writing of all of the Lindbergh ransom notes and the writing signed Hauptmann is, in my opinion, irresistible, unanswerable, and overwhelming. Scaduto learned that the handwriting comparisons were made largely on the basis of numerous forced dictations taken from Hauptmann at police headquarters. Hauptmann's written numbers could never be shown to match those on the ransom notes and there is evidence of tampering. In 1977, I was contacted by a woman named Hilda Zenglein. She was a defense handwriting expert. She was dismissed because 
she said that she would get up and testify that the original ransom notes had been tampered with to make them look more like Hauptmann's handwriting. And she sent me a, an example of what she saw and what they basically did, she said, was to round off letters in the ransom notes so they would look more like Hauptmann's handwriting. And she said it was very obvious and she was not permitted to testify. That evidence was never introduced by the defense. During the trial, many witnesses did take the stand to testify against Hauptmann. Amanda's Hawkmuth pointed to Hauptmann as the man he saw driving near the Lindbergh house on the day before the kidnapping. I found documents to show that about two months after this event, Amanda's Hawkmuth applied for welfare in New York City and it was granted because the welfare agent said, quote, he is almost totally blind, close quote. He could not have identified anyone. John F. Condon played a major role in the conviction of Bruno Hauptmann. Dr. Condon was a garrulous old man who very, very honestly wanted to help recover the Lindbergh child. And he injected himself into the case and was accepted as an intermediary. When Hauptmann was arrested, Condon was asked to identify him to see whether Hauptmann was the man to whom Condon had passed the ransom money. After looking at Hauptmann and even talking with him and shaking his hand, uh, Condon stepped out of the identification room and told police and the FBI agents that he could not identify this man. He said, this is not the man. Condon would not identify Hauptmann until two or three weeks before the trial. In the interim, he had been coerced by the police. One, he was threatened with violence. And two, he was threatened with arrest as an accomplice if he would not identify Hauptmann. Hauptmann was also identified by Charles Lindbergh himself. In the atmosphere of the trial, the testimony was damning. Lindbergh identified Hauptmann's voice as the voice he heard in the cemetery almost two and a half years before, speaking only two words, hey doctor. And that identification cinched it in the jury's mind at the very early stages. The juries later told reporters that when they heard Lindbergh say that it was Hauptmann's voice that spoke those words the night the ransom was passed, they were convinced Hauptmann was guilty. The thing is that Lindbergh, uh, after Hauptmann's arrest, heard Hauptmann speak those words again in the Bronx District Attorney's office, and for a full week he could not make up his mind. Not until the police had relayed to him all the evidence that they had compiled against Hauptmann, much of which I've later found has been tampered with, manufactured. All that evidence was given to Lindbergh as the reason that Hauptmann was indeed the kidnapper. And only after that did Lindbergh say, right i'll identify his voice and he did at the trial was bruno hauptman really guilty of the kidnap and murder of the Lindbergh child for anthony scaduto the answer is clear at best uh hauptman's role and i feel this strongly was that he had no connection in any way with the kidnapping nor with the extortion that his greatest part in it was to have taken the box full of money from Isidore Fish, not knowing it was money, not discovering it was money until months after he learned Fish had died in Germany. At worst, he could have been the receiver of stolen goods. That is, he could have known that this box actually contained money and that it contained hot money. I think what happened is once they found Hauptmann in possession of the $15,000 in ransom money, they believed firmly that he was the guilty party. Individually, police officers distorted evidence, even manufactured evidence, and suppressed evidence that would have proved his innocence because they were so firmly convinced he was guilty. And they sent him to the electric chair. If the Lindbergh baby was not the victim of Bruno Richard Hauptmann, who then kidnapped the child? Without any real conclusive evidence, because I have not been able to get into the files of the New Jersey State Police, uh, I feel rather strongly that Isidore Fish had some role in it, perhaps as the kidnapper, perhaps simply as the extortionist. And it could have been two different plots. But Isidore Fish had been a swindler. He was involved with underworld figures. And he had seen in the area of the Lindbergh home weeks, days, months, perhaps, before the kidnapping. Also, that Isidore Fish was known to have had 
uh, business dealings and personal friends in the area of Lindbergh Home in the Sauerland Mountains. In conclusion, I feel strongly that Isidore Fish, if anyone, had a large hand in the kidnapping and or extortion.